This episode of Frugal Tech is brought to you by FrugalBrothers.com, network security tools for small to mid-sized business. Business Computing Weekly, session number 434. Hey folks, welcome to Business Computing Weekly, the podcast that helps you grow your small business with power, passion, and performance. This is the first episode of 2014, and I am very happy to report our audience for the podcast is growing, and I'm doing some new things here. Every Sunday at 2 p.m., I'm going to be live streaming on Ustream, the recording of the episode, the podcast, and I invite you to join us and participate in the community chat room. There will be a link in this week's show notes where to go. It's on Ustream. It's business-computing-weekly. And I hope to see you there. And we'll just kind of see where this goes. And I'm also recording it to video and uh, posting the, uh, the podcast to YouTube as well. A little housekeeping. The complete show notes can be seen at frugal f-r-u-g-l brothers.com forward slash 434 also we have a podcast hotline which you can call area code 260-301-3818 and ask questions or leave comments for the show and perhaps we can include them in an upcoming episode well happy new year everybody and i hope that everybody has a great and successful new year ahead i'm looking forward to it and you know new year's is a time to reflect and to think back on the last year and, you know, things you've done and and would like to improve and things you'd like to change. But it also gave me a chance to think a little bit about Microsoft over uh, over the holidays and what they really mean to us small business people. And I thought I would dedicate this podcast to good old Microsoft. You know, they, they take quite a licking in the press and there's, you know, a lot of pundits out there who dismiss good old Microsoft, right? Uh, they're more in favor of you can now do things with Android and uh, Google and open source tools, you know, and use consumer class products and services to run a, a small business and a micro business, and they make a compelling case. And some of the stuff is good, and it works, and you should do it. However, I think Microsoft has not done a really good job to to communicate the message to the public in general that they are truly a business visionary, they're a small business visionary, and that they continue to build and innovate not a small business software, but software for the small to mid-sized business as well as the enterprise. And I used to be a Google Apps user myself. I have a NAS in my, my office. But there is a case to be made about a Microsoft-centric infrastructure. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to give you 10 reasons why we still need Microsoft products and services in our small businesses out there. I know, I know. I'm the first to admit I have total disdain for Windows 8. All right? I I have a couple videos on YouTube where I talk about because the, the whole modern UI, they call it now, Metro, whatever this new interface is, has no place on the modern desktop. And I make that case. Windows Phone has not been a success, as we know, but maybe it'll get there. There's always a good thing to have an alternative. And I'm no fan of Surface RT. (laughs) I'm just not in the tablet space. But that being said, I'm going to share these 10 reasons with you right now. All right? Number one, Microsoft is essentially a business software company. All right? It has been and remains committed to developing best-of-breed software for small businesses to the enterprise. And the cool thing is, with Microsoft products, is they can scale with you. What do I mean by that? Well, by scale, we're talking about grow. You can grow into them. Yes, some of them may have more bells and whistles than you're currently going to use, but as your business grows and progresses, 
You don't have to start over again with a new platform. If you start with a Microsoft platform, you are starting with something dedicated to business and making money. You know, this podcast is for everybody out there that uses technology, right, to grow and build a business, whether you're an IT professional, whether you work in IT for another, a small company, whether you own a business. That's what this podcast is for. It's about making money with computers. <laughs> Maybe that's what I should rename the show to. How to make money with computers. You know, we're not here to talk about games. And we're not here to talk about the latest graphic cards. We're here to talk about ways to improve your your money situation using all this technology. How to grow. And Microsoft products are designed to do that. Grow and scale with you. Number two. Microsoft is not dependent on advertising revenue to pay the bills, okay? You know, I'm talking specifically about our good friends at Google. I was a Google Apps customer at one time, and I'll explain to you in just a minute why I am not today. See, with Google, more or less, you're the product, and most of what they do is ad-supported. Really, just about everything's centered around selling ads. I don't know how serious they really even are about Google Apps for Business, I don't see any tremendous things in the product, any great evolutionary uh, changes in Google Apps that makes it more business-friendly. And that's not the way Microsoft does things. That's not how Microsoft rolls. So I want to bring that up. Let's let's take a look at the last quarter, a quarter ending September 30th, 2013. I want to put my money where my mouth is on there. Microsoft had revenues of $18.58 billion and a net profit of five and a quarter billion. Almost half of that revenue come from Windows Server and System Center alone. That should tell you, look, let's take Apple, for example. 50% of the revenues from the iPhone. That's a consumer phone, right? Uh, only 25% of their, their revenue comes from Macs. So the other 25% is coming from things like the iPod and and iTunes and all this other stuff. But half of their money is dedicated to the phone, to mobile computing, to the the iOS. So, you know, they're they're not going to get serious about the enterprise. They're not going to offer, you know, products like Dynamic CRM. They're not going to offer products like Microsoft Office or Outlook or any of these things. They're just not. Matter of fact... Their latest upgrade, if that's what you want to call it, I call it a downgrade of iWork, took features away. Now, Apple's not serious about it. Let's take a look at Google. Okay, it would be great to live in a cloud-based world if everybody had the bandwidth and constant connectivity and they had a feature parity with Microsoft Office. That ain't going to happen either. We're talking about trying to run your business with this stuff. Microsoft bread and butter is in selling productivity tools, not in advertising. They take business very, very seriously. I think with Google, it's more of an afterthought. This is a new opportunity to advertise. Number three, Office 365 versus Google Apps. Finally, I talk about why I'm a former, uh, former Google Apps user. I switched because of Google Docs primarily. They call it Google Drive now. And the thing about it, it simply did a horrible job handling Office documents. You know, that is these, you know, as English is the language of business, Google or Microsoft Office documents is the language of business in software and file formats. And Google Docs constantly was destroying the fidelity of documents. And if you get a Word document, you save it to Google Drive. Try doing, you can't really collaborate, uh, collaboratively, is that the word? You can't collaborate on a Microsoft Word document. You have to convert it to the Google Docs format. Well, with uh, with the Office uh, products online, it's very easy to do. And I maintain full fidelity of the documents. Also, I use Microsoft Outlook. Guess what? There's a sync tool with Google Apps, but... It doesn't work very well. It stops working all the time. It breaks constantly. It's not dependable. It's not full-featured. It's not robust enough. Nor does it appear that Google is really actively working on it. I don't really see that happening as well. 
And by the way, with the new plans of Office 365, you can get started with Office 365 for you know $60 a year per user. It's 10 bucks more than Google, but you get a whole lot more for your money. And I think for $150 per year per user, then you get the whole Office desks, uh, desktop suite in addition to um, conferencing uh, with Link. You know, you get your SkyDrive, you get uh, SharePoint Online, you get the whole kit and caboodle, the whole enchilada. We're talking real business class productivity tools. We're talking, uh, I think it's $12.50 a month per user versus, you know, $5. If you go monthly, 5 bucks a month with Google. $50 a year, $60 a year if you go monthly. is $50 a year annually. For not a whole lot more money, you get tons more for your buck. Number four. Let's talk about Windows Server. I, I get calls from time to time. Um, do I really need a server? Or can I get by with a NAS? And you know, a lot of times a micro business, a NAS will do them just fine. Will do you just fine. Nothing wrong with a NAS. A NAS is basically a server, is what it is, a file server. It has services such as print sh- printer sharing. And you know, they can do a whole lot of different things with a NAS. But there comes a point, though, that you may want to consider a server. And Windows servers are the gold standard, as far as I'm concerned. You get a win- dedicated Windows server running Windows hardware. You got a machine designed to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and take a beating. And they can do a whole lot more than file storage and print sharing. Servers offer, you know, file and network security, redundant power supplies, hot swappable components. They're generally a lot more scalable. You can do things like run virtualized operating systems on them. You can facilitate uh, virus management on there, do centralized backup, run server-specific applications such as SQL Server as your business grows. It make virtualization easier. you got services such as Windows Terminal Services for virtualized, or for, I should say for uh, you know uh, some desktops, virtualized desktop applications. All that with Windows Server... You're not going to really do that easily or at all with a NAS. You know, a NAS is what a NAS is. It's basically a, a form of network attached storage. That's what its chief purpose is, is another place to share files on your network. You want to do things like apply group policy and enforce security and all this. You still need a server. And Windows Server is the way to go. Number five. Microsoft has a huge army of professionally and certified technicians all over the world. So whether you're doing business in York, London, Los Angeles, wherever, and you run into a snag with a Microsoft infrastructure, it's not going to be that difficult to get world-class support right away and at and affordable prices. Now, that's the thing about open source stuff, right? You run into a snag with an open source you know, project, a lot of times you're on your own. You're trying to figure out how to fix the problem. You're pouring over forums, and maybe you're hiring really expensive consultants to come in and fix the problem. And you got to hunt those people down. So you spend a lot of time, a lot of your valuable time, that you could be running your business trying to fix a problem with open source. That's when free is not free. I know personally, I have run into this situation myself. We were working on an open source uh, project, the stack, uh, to do a uh, an anti-spam solution in the form of appliance. And our engineers got stuck with a problem deep within uh, one of the open source projects we are combining. We ultimately ended up having to hire a consultant ourselves because we could not find a solution. It's like, well, yeah, other people have the same problem. Well, that wasn't going to work for us. So we, I've been there. I know that free is not free when it comes to open source, nor can you guarantee the quality of file fidelity or the other features compared to a competing Microsoft product. This is what I'm saying. And finding uh, certified Microsoft professionals is not hard to do, and Microsoft themselves offers world-class support as well. I don't know how many times I've been in a jam, got a hold of Microsoft, and they got me squared right away. And they've got people available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, just throwing that out there. Number six. Look, it's all about productivity. 
Microsoft line of business applications, you know, we're talking about Microsoft CRM, Microsoft Office, Dynamics, GP, SQL, Server, all these. And the thing, the best thing about this is when you build around a Microsoft infrastructure, generally all these products seamlessly work with Office. So your users have this seamless experience across the board. Learn to use one, you're basically learning how to use another. It's all tied together. When you take a variety of open source projects, well, your Office suite doesn't talk to your email application. This doesn't talk to, uh, maybe you're trying to use Outlook. doesn't work with that. You need a plug-in. Buy the optional plug-in. That may or may not work. It gets ugly quick. It really and truly does. It gets really, really quick. Trying to make all these open source projects, cloud-based stuff, all work together in a seamless experience. Microsoft, by using that infrastructure from the get-go, uh, you've got a, a head start against uh, dealing with those kind of problems. You're not going to deal with those kind of problems. Microsoft makes sure of it. Number seven, Microsoft Office. This is the gold standard by which all other office suites are judged, okay? Now, and there are some op um, open source alternatives that come pretty doggone close, and for some people it may be all you need. I understand that. I get that. And I don't recommend you, you buy things you don't need or never will never need. But, okay, I have yet to see an open so source alternative to Outlook. There was um, evolution, I think, in the world of Linux. It doesn't work right with Exchange, if at all. Certain plugin you have to get, it may or may not. I don't even know if it's still supported. Nothing like that. Again, we get back to file fidelity issues. Features across the board. And, you know, as I said, as a small business, you can subscribe to Office 365 Premium now for $12.50 a month per user. And you're going to get, you know, upgrades when, when new versions come out. You're going to get the full enchilada as a small business customer. You're going to have the desktop applications, the cloud-based applications, conferencing, file sharing, everything, collaboration. You're going to get it all. $12.50 a month versus the $5 a month for $7.50 more. What is that? Pennies a day. We're talking real, powerful, performance, business class tools. That's when I'm, there's just no, there's just no way around it in the business world. If you're a consumer if you're a student, it's, it's, it's a different ball game. It's an entirely different ball game. But if you're trying to make a dollar with your computer, and, and you depend on these things to make a living, then you want to pay attention to this sort of thing. Okay, um, we just finished on that uh, Microsoft Office. Number eight. I'm going to get back to open source software a little bit. Open source software. Might be free to download, but can ultimately be end up being prohibitively expensive. Right? Not all open source software, for example, permits you to use it in a commercial setting. You got to look over the, the license with it to make sure you're not violating something there. Don't even think about modifying it. Just even yes, you can. Maybe you can. Maybe you can't. But don't even think. Let's not even go there about modification of open source software. Now, but the real kicker is meaningful and reliable support. Try to find it. I guarantee you it's going to cost you money. Because if, you know, people buy, download this stuff because it's free, right? It's free to download. I want it free. Until they run into a problem. Then you're going to pay. You're going to pay with money, and you're going to pay with time, and time is money, so you're going to pay twice. At the time you try, you try to exhaust all the free resources and finally end up paying somebody to fix the problem if they can fix it. And now you got even more expense involved. I'm just saying, I've run into this stuff. Number nine. And I think this is important Microsoft Windows. I've yet to see any, you know, Good business app, uh, business application that didn't run on Windows. Just they're not out there. If it's something decent, there's a Windows version. It was probably written for Windows to begin with. Some things maybe end up being ported to Mac. I haven't really seen any best of breed business applications ported to Linux. 
Maybe that'll happen. But as of right now, it's not. Nothing, nada. And unfortunately, on the Mac side of things, I hate to say it, but uh, even the Microsoft software on Mac doesn't really hold a candle, in my opinion, to the Windows-based version when it comes to features and so forth. The accounting world out there, forget about it. I mean, yeah, there is, you know, there's Account Edge and there's QuickBooks. I know QuickBooks for sure for the Mac is pitiful compared to the Windows version. I can't speak intelligently about Account Edge, but I, I definitely know the QuickBooks version is terrible. Um, it's just the way it is. Uh, the Mac market is kind of an afterthought to some of these large software houses. Windows is where it's at for business productivity software. And forget about Linux, okay? If, if Just forget about it. You're not going to find any of the big popular titles. You're not going to find QuickBooks for Linux. You're not going to find... And I know you can use Wine and emulators... And you can run virtual machines and all that. I get that. Okay, so you saved some money on a Windows license. Is it worth it? We're talking about your business here. And that is my final point of today's podcast. It's your business. This podcast is for you. All right? You know, the bottom line is, ask yourself this question. Is it worth investing in the right tools from the very beginning? Or do you do something different in the name of saving money? And you know what you're going to do? You're going to paint yourself into this technology corner. And then you're ultimately going to spend more time, more money, more resources to fix the problem because you painted yourself into this technology corner in order to save those few dollars in the very beginning. Is it worth it? Whatever it is your business is landscaping, roofing company, contractor, restaurant, bar, movie theater, whatever it is you do, that's what you do, right? That's what you do. You shouldn't have to spend your time and resources dealing with buggy, unreliable, unsupported software that is feature incomplete when it's right there. It's right there. So that's it. That's my 10 reasons why small business still needs Microsoft and why they're going to remain relevant far into the future. And I think on that note, we're going to wrap up this week's installment of Business Computing Weekly. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this podcast or watching us on YouTube. I really appreciate it. Love to hear from you. Post your comments and the uh, show notes page on business uh, on frugalbrothers.com. Love to hear from you. Or if you're going to watch the YouTube video, leave your comments in the video. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great and productive week. Remember, if it's, not in, if it's in your shop, not making you money or saving you money, get it out of there. We'll talk to you later.